Good morning to everyone who's joined us so far. We will be starting in about a minute. We'll give, uh, give everyone a little longer to join us and then we'll kick off. Morning again to everyone who's with us so far, 30 seconds, and uh, we'll get started with today's webinar. Okay, I think we might be good to go. So good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for taking some time out of your day to join us um, this morning to hear a bit more around the dark web, around digital risk monitoring, and to hear a bit from our friends at Digital Shadows about the work they do in that space. Um, this is the fifth, I believe, webinar in the series of webinars we're doing this week. Um, there's a whole variety of content going on this week uh, from some of the fantastic names we can see on the screen at the moment. Um, but let's get straight into today's session. So just uh, before I start, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the session today, um, you will be muted throughout, but if you do have any questions, I will encourage that for sure. But please do use the chat box um, in, in the Zoom room if you could, and we will uh, address all of those questions at the end of the section. We've got a Q&A section towards the end. Um, we are recording this session as well. So you will be sent a link for, sorry, bear with me. Sorry about that. Um, so the session will be recorded. Everyone will be sent a link uh, shortly after the session. And if there are too many questions to address at the end, we'll get uh, responses back to all of those and we'll, we'll include that in that follow up for you as well. But we will keep this interactive. There'll be a few polls throughout, so we'll keep you on your toes um, and we'll share those results with you as we go. Now, I am joined by my colleague Chris Morgan from Digital Shadows. Chris is a senior cyber threat intelligence analyst over there, and you're going to be hearing a lot more from Chris this morning. Before I do hand over though, let me briefly go through the agenda and what you can expect to hear about um, today. So we've covered the, the bytes bit. Um, Chris is gonna kick off with um, filling you in on some of the latest trends that they're seeing on the deep dark web um, and, and where, where the cyber criminals don't want you looking for, for the data of yours possibly that they're trying to, uh, to sell on the, on the markets there. We can look at some key identifiers that can ensure that you remain protected and that you're aware of this activity that's that's ongoing in those areas of the internet um, that aren't necessarily too public. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with a bit around threat intelligence, um, look into the dark web and some examples there as well, which can be quite exciting, and um, explore surface attack monitoring as well. And like I said, we will we'll wrap up with the Q&A section at the end if you do have any throughout feel free to chuck them into the box and we will absolutely get to those. But enough of me. Chris, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Toby, and thanks for the warm welcome. Um, good morning, everyone. Really delighted to come speak to you today. Um, as Toby just mentioned, today's topic of discussion will be on the dark web and the numerous criminal services operating on this portion of the internet. I will just share my screen now. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, I'm just gonna stop my video at this point, um, just for streaming reasons, but I'll switch it on later. Um, but yeah, kicking off um, a little quick PR spin about my employer uh, before we get going. Um, I work for Digital Shadows, who are an industry leader in 
providing digital risk protection, which is protecting our clients from external threats, uh, continually identifying where client assets might be exposed, providing context to understand their cyber risk, and also options for remediation. So tracking and providing assessment on the various cyber extortion actors, uh, many of which who operate on the dark web, is one of the key things we do to protect our clients from being impacted by malicious activity. So my team, which is part of the intelligence function of the Digital Shadows Service, can be seen on the slide now. Um, essentially, our role is to provide our clients context and understanding of the cyber threat landscape. Uh, and as I've just mentioned, you know, provide those insights that can really lower their cyber risk. We do that by providing regular intelligence updates on external incidents of note, um, answer, answering bespoke RFIs, um, providing research papers and investigation, um, and then other external material like blogs, weekly podcasts. Um, we have, you know, an in sum that goes out every Friday. Um, and also uh, we have a, a particularly talented closed sources team who are tasked with providing intelligence on the, the various criminal actors that operate on the dark web and other restricted portions of the internet. So what's in this presentation today? So we'll be starting with some definitions of what is the deep web and what is the dark web. We'll be going through what criminal services are operating on the dark web um, and how this portion of the internet is also contributing towards the rise of ransomware, which I'm sure everyone on this call is aware is you know, by far and away the, the fastest growing form of cybercrime. And finally, we'll finish with some details on digital risk protection and how this can assist in lowering your company's digital risk. Uh, before we do jump onto that one, uh, I think we have a quick poll for you all to gauge current understanding of what uh, the dark web is. Um, so I think Toby, I'll need your assistance in this one. <laughs> yep, no problem. I think that should be launched now so everyone can hear that. So first question of the day, nice easy for you. What is the dark web? What do you reckon? <laughs> Sounds good. I'm just setting off a timer now. We'll give everyone a minute uh, just to answer this. Yeah, we've got some lengthy answers in there, so we'll give everyone a chance to digest the possibilities there. Okay, most of those have come through. We've got a variety of answers there. I think um, there is a consensus uh, of sorts. I think most people here are, uh, are thinking that it's sites that are only available through specific software or browsers, which could be said to be true. Uh, a few they're thinking, um, or websites that are not indexed by search engines, again, could be true. What are your th thoughts on that, Chris? Was that a bit of a trick question? uh not trick question as such i i think you can argue you know that the deep web is websites that are not indexed by search engines and that the dark web is referencing the use of certain softwares as everyone you know pretty much most of the people on the the call have alluded to on their answers um the likes of the onion router which is probably the the best known one i'll just move on to the next slide actually because we'll we'll kind of go through this um and you know, I'm sure everybody's seen this slide in some fashion before. Uh, so the surface web, I'll start with that, is the, the portion of the, the World Wide Web which is readily available to the general public and searchable with, with standard web search engines. Um, so you can see some examples on the slide now, basically websites that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this section of the internet is indexed by search engines and, and as I say, known as the, the surface web or the visible web uh, is often referred to. Uh, the deep web is a part of the internet where contents are not indexed by standard search engines. Um, so the content behind deep web is, is hidden behind HTTP forms, uh, including webmail, online banking, uh, services that users must pay for, uh, which are protected, you know, potentially behind a paywall. There might be video that's on demand, some online magazines and newspapers, and, and, and many, all web, many more websites as well. Um, 
you know, content of the deep web can be located and accessed by a direct URL or IP address, uh, but also may require a password or other security access past the, the public website page. The dark web, that's defined as a layer of information and pages that you can only get access to through um, overlay networks, which run on top of the normal internet and obscure access. Um, so you need special software to access the dark web because a lot of it is encrypted. Um, and most of the dark web pages are hosted anonymously. Uh, so this slide pretty much represents the same thing. You know, it's highlighting that the surface web is typically indexed by, you know, search engines, deep web hosting content not um, hosted by those search engines and, and typically being gated. And the dark web only being accessible through certain software or browsers. So the most popular being the one that I mentioned before, the Onion Router or Tor. Um, another one, um, I2P, that, that's quite common. Um, so this is the, the, the differentiations between those three portions of the internet. So now that's out of the way, um, I guess we can move on to the, the interesting part of today's session. You know, what horrors are stored on the dark web? Um, well, to be honest, it's, it's probably what you think. Um, you know, you can find you know, any number of drugs, paraphernalia, you know, weaponry, pornography, but also cyber threat actors discussing you know, attacks they've conducted or they're planning to conduct. Uh, conduct. And in terms of the, the types of websites and services available, it can be roughly broken down into the, the four types you can see on screen now. So forums, uh, ransomware leak sites, marketplaces, and automated vending carts or AVCs. So starting with forums, cybercriminal forums essentially offer a platform for user interaction. A cybercriminal forum performs you know, diverse functions, so supporting discussion, the sharing of ideas and trade, uh, many of these are free to browse and join, but other forums are more restrictive and require an invitation from a pre-vetted forum member, uh, potentially a sustained interaction or you know, even a payment to get onto the website. Forums are typically run by a handful of individ individuals, uh, funny enough, known as administrators or moderators, which help make sure that discussions are relevant on our topic and that house rules are abided by. Um, and obviously this is very similar to a, you know, a standard benign forum that I'm, I'm sure we're all a member of in some fashion. Many cyber criminal forums also feature marketplace sections, which um, advertisements appear to drive traffic to, to verified marketplaces. Uh, many forums even display listings for goods and services, but these are often more specialized and limited in availability. And like marketplaces, the credibility of sellers, you know, often relies on the reputation and their customer service. So, for example, a user might advertise the sale of an administrative access to a company or a sophisticated piece of malware. But this will only be open to discussion with serious buyers. Um, sometimes they'll demand the buyer places money into an escrow system ahead of negotiation, which is something we'll touch upon later. And once funds are committed, you know, it's less likely that a would-be buyer would back out of the transaction, which is a win-win for the vendor. Um, sometimes trades on forums are fraught with danger, and the, the arbitration section on many forums is, you know, witness to this. Um, and forums feature varying levels of membership. So having a certain number of posts, paying a membership fee, you know, can often give you exclusive perks, like access to hidden sections of a forum or the ability to add um, color or flair to your username display, which sounds a bit ridiculous, but it often does um, assist the user in their you know, legitimacy. Um, forums are typically centered around one overarching theme. Um, so I, you know, being a hacking forum, um, but to keep things neat, they'll also have several sub forums dedicated to other topics. And, you know, even the most nefarious, nefarious forums can have sections which allow for off-topic discussion of you know movies or music or video games. So what you can see on screen now is a uh, an example of a, a criminal forum, uh, funny enough, named Torum. So this was a partly gated English language cyber criminal forum with um, a focus on hacking techniques, malware, tooling, and data leaks. Um, in 2019, you know this forum really increased in prominence within the English language cyber criminal scene. Following, following the demise of other key forums, and it grew to be a respected player in the English language uh, criminal scene. 
and the forum had amassed approximately 130,000 members before its administrator took the site offline in mid-August 2020. Another pretty well-known cyber criminal forum is Exploit, which is um, a Russian language forum. Uh, Exploit is um, uh, widely considered to be one of the most prestigious underground platforms and often regarded as a site on which many of the, the most valuable goods are traded. Some of the most successful cyber criminals you know, operate on this, on this forum, and some of the most in interesting discussions about malware and techniques take place here. So exploit is, is fully gated, meaning that to view any of the site's content, users must pay uh, a fee or demonstrate their worth as a potential member. Um, the site predominantly operates in Russian, although as you can see on the screen right now, um, a proportion of the site is English language content, which has slowly increased in recent years. Um, and interestingly, Russian speakers are generally quite hostile towards English speakers on the forum, with men many frequently uh, calling for non-Russian speakers to be banned from the site and you know, otherwise refusing to transact with, with English speakers. There's almost a, a widespread belief that um, English speakers are more likely to be scammers trying to deceive forum users um, and that English speaking users you know, post um, empty posts to, to kind of reduce the quality of discussion on the site. And like many Russian language forums, um, exploit prohibits targeting victims within the former Soviet Union. So, you know, even amongst criminals, you can kind of see those, those nationalistic tendencies and, and hostilities come to surface. Um, another Russian language uh, cyber criminal forum is XSS, which is a relaunch of Damage Lab, one of the, the earliest Russian language forums that was closed following an administrator's involvement with law enforcement. Following a, a period of rebuilding, you know, this is now one of the most prominent uh, Russian language uh, platforms with high levels of activity and a particularly uh, active databases section. Uh, the site is not gated, uh, but users you know, frequently restrict access to sections of their posts. And along with another uh, popular English language forums called RAID forums, uh, this is where you know, we at Digital Shadows generate a huge amount of our intelligence. Um, one of the main things that goes into the likes of RAID forums and XSS is initial access broker listings, which you should be able to see on the screen right now. Um, initial access brokers or IABs do the technical dirty work by providing ransomware operators with a wealth of victims to compromise. So this is a real symbol of cyber criminal professionalization. Um, and they act as a, a middleman by finding these vulnerable organizations and then selling access to them to the highest bidder on, on several you know, dark web forums. Their rise in popularity you know, really follows the trend of lowered barriers of entry to entering the world of cybercrime. So you know, it, it's really gone hand in hand with, with what we're seeing from a ransomware perspective and, and several other forms of, of uh, cyber criminal extortion. So I think we have another another poll, Toby, if you want to bring that one up. And I'll just set a timer off once that's done. So Absolutely. we'll give everyone, uh, a minute to, to finish this one. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I hope everyone is listening because this question is, what is the most popular IAB listing? Fastest finger first. <laughs> Got a real mixed bag of answers coming through. Mm -hmm. We'll give you another 30 seconds or so. So what I'm seeing so far is no clear leader. Most people are thinking RDP, closely followed by VPN and Shell coming up last. No one's saying Citrix at the moment. We'll, uh, I guess we'll, we'll halt there. So I guess it's another a bit of a, a trick question in that they're, they're all popular listings, but as you can see on the next slide, um, pretty much it, it, it's quite close, but RDP is the, the most, often the most prized access type. Um, so what you can see on the slide at the moment is an analysis of more than 500 listings. Um, 
that really showed that initial access brokers could exploit you know, various access types for their active activities. And a reason for this is because um, access brokers have a, a vast spectrum of sophistication and technical expertise. You know, some are more talented than others. However, the potential lack of technical knowledge doesn't make these actors any less of a threat. Um, they tend to be customer agnostic and, you know, they just sell their accesses to the highest bidder, really. And as a consequence of, you know, remote working models that were enforced in 2020, you know, virtual private network accesses were, you know, really high in the um, accesses that are listed in cyber criminal forums. And, you know, this, this shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, unpatched software, you know, weak credentials are unfortunately present on many corporate laptops, making organizations vulnerable to, to these types of threats. And, you know, for VPN, for example, um, Digital Shadows observed that the average price for VPN access is around $3,000, but, you know, prices do vary based on the organization's size, their geographical location and their industry. But the RDP is, you know, we found was the most uh, popular access type sold by access brokers and just, you know, really highlighting the enormous risk that's posed by remote services that are unpatched, they're internet facing or otherwise with weak credentials. I, I could, you know, list so many different examples of where RDP has been used as the the entry point onto, onto a pretty impactful incident. Um, and, you know, if your RDP instances are configured in such a an unsafe manner, then I, I can't recommend highly enough, you know, just sorting them out as soon as you can. Um, we'll move on now and detail the escrow system, um, which briefly, sorry, I'm just getting a phone call. I will turn that off. Um, and the escrow system is basically a financial agreement in which a third party controls payment between two transacting parties and only release the funds involved when all of the terms of a given contract are met. These are extremely commonplace on Russian language forums and marketplaces. And most platforms offer an official escrow system for their members. Um, typically, that's done by um, a senior member of the forum, you know, designated as the kind of trusted guarantor. And as you imagine, in a world that's populated by criminals, conflicts are you know extremely commonplace, and often an arbitration is required to settle disputes. Um, so this is typically done, like I say, by a senior member of the forum who will hear both sides version of events and kind of collect evidence from the, the plaintiff and the defendant, you know, which is usually in the form of kind of conversation logs from the private messaging service. Um, other forum members can kind of chip in with their own opinions and perhaps share their experiences of working with each of the parties. And the senior forum member will take all of this in, um, consider it and then, you know, decide on the case and potentially demand reimbursement of funds order compensation to be paid or, you know, potentially marking one of the users as a, as a scammer and banning them from the forum. Um, this slide details some of the payment methods that are used on these, on these criminal services, which you can, you can see. Um, as you'd imagine, you know, when you're not, when you're paying for illicit materials, you know, you're not going to do so with your, your standard credit card and bank inf information you know, registered all with, with your, your personal information. Um, almost everything that's sold or advertised on these sites is going to be purchased using cryptocurrency. So some of the most popular ones up there are Bitcoin, Monero, and Ethereum. And one development that's happened recently is a number of criminal forums have actually started moving towards using Monero only and actually banning Bitcoin, mostly due to the fact that Bitcoin has been so volatile in its conversion rates so I personally know, you know quite a few people who invest in cryptocurrency, but I just don't think I'm willing to ride that roller coaster given the highs and lows. And I imagine a lot of the criminal actors have, have recognized that using a more consistent payment method is also a safer bet too. So in terms of you know, what is being done to combat these criminal forums, you know, 2021 has seen an increased amount of law enforcement activity targeting criminal services. You know, this includes the dark market marketplace uh, in mid-January, and of course, we'll, we'll get onto marketplaces shortly. Um, infrastructure associated with the Emotet Trojan and you know, several ransomware groups. Um, and how effective has this activity been? Well, you know, one thing to note is that the overwhelming majority of these criminal services are 
as I commented earlier, you know, hosted by individuals that reside in Russia or um, the former, former Soviet Union. And the attitude of law enforcement within these countries is fairly lax. You could probably view it as either they're disinterested in tackling these groups or, you know, they lack the resources to do so. I'd say it's probably more to do with the former. So, for example, um, ransomware groups that, you know, they don't target companies that are based in um, CIS countries. And as a result, the scrutiny from Russian police is, is going to be lower. Um, law enforcement operations have had some success in removing criminal forums and, you know, ransomware leak sites. But to be honest with you, I, I kind of view the idea of, you know, that game whack-a-mole. Um, you know, you can disrupt these sites, but ultimately they're going to return in some fashion or be replaced by another group. So unfortunately, these types of criminal services are highly likely to be here to stay in the, over the long term. So we'll now move on to ransomware and the, the data leak sites that they operate. Um, I, I probably don't need to go into too much detail on what ransomware is. Um, this is one of the, the biggest threats and highest trending attack vectors impacting companies today. Um, rat criminal actors, you know, they, what, essentially what they do is deliberately encrypt sensitive data and services at corporate targets in order to solicit a ransom fee, often in the range of hundreds of thousands or potentially tens of millions of dollars, pretend, uh, depending on the company size. Um, again, I, I don't want to make this presentation solely on ransomware, but just a, a heads up on some of the big developments in the ransomware industry over the last few years. So the introduction of uh, ransomware as a service programs, which essentially allows uh, lesser skilled affiliates to, to carry out attacks on um, a ransomware group's behalf by them uh, renting their, their infrastructure and their malware to do those attacks. Uh, big game hunting, in which ransomware groups target enterprise networks, uh, predominantly because they realize they can solicit a higher ransom fee. Um, and then the, the introduction of uh, introduction, uh, rather, of data leak sites in which um, ransomware groups deliberately exfiltrate data alongside, you know, encrypting, uh, deliberately encrypting uh, data on, on a targeted company as well, and then use that as an additional reason for the company to pay ransom. And this has been, you know, a, a massive problem. This is really coincided with um, a big explosion in the number of ransomware groups and the not only the success in, of the ransom, but the, the, the size that these, these attackers are able to um, produce in ransom fees from a single intrusion onto a company's network. Um, you just have this double, uh, it's, it's, I don't know if I mentioned, it's uh, called double extortion. So you have this double pronged attack of your data and services being knocked offline for extended periods of time, and also a massive risk from, um, a, a data breach as well. So this is this has really been a huge problem um, in, in the last year or so. Um, you see a, a typical ransom note on screen right now. Um, so Network Walker were uh, a group that were taken down uh, by law enforcement activity uh, a short while ago. Um, but you can see, you know, the type of things that they're <laughs> they're, they're posting to, to impacted companies. You know, uh, you can see the the place where they're, they're supposed to import personal codes, um, an explanation of what's happened and um, an explanation that if they contact law enforcement, then it's going to be impossible for, for the, the company to recover these files. Um, you can see on screen right now, uh, data leak sites for three different groups. So Lockbit, uh, Clop and Doppelpamer. And you know, this, they're all very common in what they do. They'll, they'll publicly name a victim on the site, explain what they've taken offline and, and what they've exfiltrated. Um, they'll often provide snippets of data exfiltrated from the company as proof and a countdown of when the remaining data will be posted. Um, this is always done on a, an, an onion router domain. So, you know, extremely little, little chance of the site being taken down or any real ability for law enforcement to remove the material, you know, like you would on a, a typ typical clear web or um, surface web hosted website. And yeah, this slide just again confirming, you know, I can't emphasize enough how, you know, double extortion has revolutionized the ransomware industry and resulted in a greater level of payment from targeted companies. 
Um, this in turn has likely contributed towards spawning several new ransomware groups, all looking to profit on this highly lucrative business. You know, there's, there's other factors at play, you know, like the, the introduction of the, the ransomware as a service. Um, but um, one point to make is that unfortunately these, these groups are going nowhere and in all likelihood it's, it's probably going to get worse. Um, so uh, just, just want to bear in mind, I guess. Uh, moving on to marketplaces. So deep and dark web marketplaces serve as a platform for cyber criminals to buy and sell goods. Uh, these goods aren't, you know, your typical organic fruit and vegetable options you'll find at the local farmer's market. Uh, they overwhelmingly facilitate the sale of illicit items like drugs, fraudulent documents, malware, uh, counterfeit documents. Uh, and unlike forums, which encourage conversation and discussion, marketplaces offer a centralized hub to sell illicit goods. Um, ease, you know, it's highly, you know, easily done, um, really good accessibility, which is at the epicenter of their business model. And to encourage trading, you know, an eBay style trust system is typically enforced, whereby vendors receive ratings from their buyers, typically determined by their sales history and their level of customer service. And just like the ratings we use to drive our platforms, uh, eBay and, and Amazon, you know, these systems exist to weed out scammers and promote only the, the most reputable of, uh, of sellers. And you can see on screen right now, you know, types of material that's sold on marketplaces. Uh, one that's glaringly missing here is drugs, which does make up a huge percentage of the, the listings available on various marketplaces, um, but obviously does depend on, you know, each site. Um, so here's an example of a, a prominent marketplace you know, which has actually come into, uh, back into existence in the, in the last month. So Alpha Bay was a marketplace established in 2014 that quickly rose to be a massive player in the cyber criminal community during its uh, rather short-lived e existence. Um, innovation and diversification were two of the main drivers for the, for the marketplace's success. Um, it was one of the, the first um, marketplaces to implement the escrow system and digital contracts as well as accepting cryptocurrencies like Monero and Ethereum. And after just three years of existence, Alpha Bay had more than 200,000 active users and 40,000 vendors, you know, numbers that are just way too big to be ignored by, by law enforcement, which is why in July, 2017, an international law enforcement operation actually managed to take down the marketplace and allegedly arrest uh, well, not allegedly, they did arrest one of its founders, um, a, a guy who went under the username Alpha02, who later uh, committed suicide in a, a Thai prison. And with Alpha Bay's demise, soon followed by the takedown of another marketplace called Hansa, law enforcement had, had really managed to instill a profound sense of distrust in the cyber criminal community and, and also create a, a substantial void in the dark web marketplace scene. Fast forward to August 2021, and a user, um, the snake, who was kind of a, an, an original member of the, uh, the Alpha Bay community, announced the return of uh, this pretty historic uh, marketplace following a four year hiatus. Um, the announcement took security research, researchers and cyber criminals alike by surprise. And it's not uncommon for, for cyber criminal operations to come back after a period of inactivity, but it did raise a, <laughs> quite a few eyebrows, you know, due to the timing and the sort of the implications of this event. And, and ultimately, it, it's still unclear whether the return of this marketplace is legitimate or another scam. Uh, we actually put, you know, quite a good blog on this on this topic together and conducted a, a SWOT analysis across the team to determine whether you know we thought that Alpha Bay's return signified you know whether you know whether it was legitimate whether it was a scam whether it was part of a wider law enforcement effort to track users um, you can see the front of that blog on screen and and definitely it's it's something worth checking out and that finally brings us to automated vending carts or AVCs which are websites that sell goods without the need for a buyer vendor interaction and really allows for a quick and seamless transaction. So these sites can support the sale of a wide range of items like financial information, 
um, app accounts, email accounts, you know, remote desktop protocol accesses, as we were talking about earlier. And in the, in the case of, of carding AVCs, credit card or bank account data is you know, really available en masse to, to support the kind of carding economy. And carding AVCs allow prospective buyers to kind of sort through sales via origin company, uh, origin country, uh, the type, the expiry date, uh, price, and, and other filters as well. And an example of the type of information available for purchase on a carding ABC is a dump, which is a string of data captured from a credit card, mag uh, its magnetic strip. And these can be used to create fraudulent uh, physical cloned cards. Um, ABCs also sell um, CVV2s or falls, which kind of differ from dumps in that they are used for online purchases. And they typically include more specific data like the card number, the card holder's name, their physical address, um, the expiry date, and you know, potentially even social security numbers or phone numbers, email addresses, et cetera. And you can actually see on screen right now um, an example of an English language ABC, um, ironically called Russian Market, uh, which is a site that sells a range of illicit products, including stolen card verification values, uh, credit card dumps, um, RDP accesses. Um, and the example on screen, you know, details, CVV details um, that are offered for sale on Russian market. So overall, Russian market offers users with a range of illicit material, very easily that can be filtered and purchased for, for low prices. And you know, we, we often talk about the professionalization of cyber criminal services. And I think that the, the likes of AVCs in permitting a quick sale of this type of material has really greatly assisted uh, a budding cyber criminal in starting you know, their, their various malicious or fraudulent acts. It, it really can just be purchased extremely easily. So I guess that brings us on to, you know, why should you care? You know, what is the individual risk to your company from the various threats that we've, we've detailed today? And, you know, I should, I should probably start with a definition, you know, detailing digital risk protection. Um, so DRP reduces risk that emerges from digital transformation, protects against unwanted exposures of a company's data, its brand and attack surface, and provides actionable insights on threats from the uh, open, deep, and the dark web. So we know that opportunistic adversaries will actively seek and exploit exposed information. They'll look for um, exposed admin passwords on GitHub, a leaked vulnerability assessment, network diagrams, um, and, and even organizations that, you know, you, you sit there and you say, oh, well, we're not interesting enough for an attacker to target. They will have resources that have monetary value for criminals. And you know, digital risk protection has, you know, three areas of focus. It's detecting that data loss, it's securing, it's securing identity and your online brand and reducing the attack service. Um, and, you know, this is where digital shadows, you know, really does shine. And you can see on screen right now, we were recently named as a top performer, ranking number one in an, an analysis of 19 vendors in the digital risk protection market. Um, in a new study carried out by Quadrant Knowledge Solutions. And you can see on screen right now, you know, these are just some of the types of threats that are covered by clients of ours using a combination of our proprietary software, which is called Searchlight, um, and our you know, team of talented analysts. And Searchlight protects our clients against external threats. So it's a, it's a managed solu solution that enables you to minimize your digital risk by detecting data loss, um, you know, as I say, you know, really looking at your online brand and, and ascertaining any threats that emerge from that, um, you know, really trying to reduce that attack service where necessary. And, you know, it contains a wealth of, of cyber threat intelligence from an unrivaled number of sources. I, I think it's over 1.1 billion now, which you'll see on the next slide, I think. And every day we're releasing intelligence updates and you know tippers on everything that's influencing the cyber threat landscape including coverage of uh, i believe it's 38 distinct ransomware groups and their operations um you know which does change on a, a daily pretty much a daily basis it seems 
um, does does fluctuate. But as I commented earlier, I would only imagine that the ransomware problem is going to get worse. Um, but you know, from a dark web perspective, and obviously that's the, common, the topic of our presentation today. You know, we're looking at insider threats. You know, fraud, supplier-based threats, um, exposed credentials. You know, these are just a, a snapshot of the types of risk that we can assist in, in detecting before it's too late. Um, you can see on screen right now, you know, a, a version of our portal's main screen um, with the, you know, the reference to the number of sources. Uh, at the top there is the, the triage option where our clients will update their assets in order for Searchlight to detect any potential risk. Um, you know, it's as simple as, you know, updating your assets, um, you know, whatever that might be, you know, CIDR and IP ranges, domains, executive names, uh, brand and third party partners. And Searchlight will identify any potential risks before providing automated alerting in real time on the triage tab. Um, and at this point, you know, we, we do uh, identify options for remediation or uh, further investigation if necessary. And contained within Searchlight is the, the shadow search function, um, which you can see in the top right. Um, this allows our clients to search our enormous repository of threat data on you know, pretty much what, whatever takes your interest. Um, shadow search is based on a, a Boolean logic and it can be used as a you know, hugely useful tool for conducting investigations on a, a raft of topics. Um, you know, whether that's finding out about a particular actor and determining um, associated IOCs and techniques, uh, searching on a particular domain or email address, uh, you know, finding context that can really assist your incident response. And we also have a, a new feature coming in the next year that's really going to assist vulnerability management in, you know, prioritizing which vulnerabilities to patch first. Um, and what you can see on screen right now is, is one of our dedicated uh, threat profiles for uh, the Conti ransomware group. Um, this is just the overview section and the kind of in-depth section goes into a, a far greater level of detail. Um, but, you know, there's a wealth of service. You know, I'm not going to go into that today. You know, this is a presentation on a dark web and not just a, a, a searchlight sales pitch. But, you know, please do get in touch if, uh, if you're interested in hearing more. Um, very quickly, you can see on screen right now some of our free resources we issue on a, a regular basis. Uh, we have blogs that are, you know, written predominantly by our, our research team, but you know, also does have several other contributors within the company. There's the Shadow Talk podcast that that sort of flicks between um, our US team and the the rest of world side of the house on a, a bi weekly basis. Uh, there's research papers, and not mentioned on screen is a, a weekly insum. Uh, detailing an event of interest that's likely to have an effect on the threat landscape. For example, uh, last week I detailed Microsoft's decision to move to a uh, passwordless uh, model uh, for their users, or at least give their users the, the option to, to move to passwordless accounts. Um, you know, what impact is this going to have? You know, will they be adopted by regular users? And, and what does this mean for sort of credential based attacks in the future? You know, that's, that's what I, I covered in last week's in sum. And um, pretty much that, that concludes what I would like to cover today. Um, you can see our contact details on the slide there uh, for those who'd like to request further information on our service. Um, I can also be contact and I'll, I'll share my email in, in the, the Zoom chat. Um, and yeah, really happy to, to take some, some questions if we have any, Toby. Thanks for that, Chris. Really good insights there. Um, so thanks for taking us through that. And we do have a few questions. I will take this opportunity to encourage everyone else to chuck in any questions they might have off the back of that into the chat. And we'll get to them after the few that we've had in already. Um, so I have one here. How do you think the dark web has assisted the growth of the ransomware industry? So I think there's there's been lots of different factors which have contributed to all this problem so as i alluded to before the you know the biggest three issues in my mind have have been the introduction of you know ransomware as a service programs you know which has really widened the number of cyber criminals who are capable of committing an attack uh, big game hunting you know where they're specifically targeting you know enterprise networks and obviously that the final thing being you know data exfiltration you know, that really has exponentially raised the risk from a, a ransomware attack. Um, 
you know, many companies that they might be able to survive a ransomware attack if, if they have a robust backup. But if you've had a, a data exfiltration event, then, you know, there realistically isn't too much you can do other than get ready for the impact that will cause. You know, what the, the dark web has done is act as an enabler for these acts. So, you know, it, it really does act as a, a communication channel for, for ransomware activities to coordinate their activities. Um, you know, including coordinating affiliates on the, the ransomware as a service programs I mentioned. Um, it permits initial access broker listings that, that highlight entry points for, for big companies. And then obviously it also acts as a place where stolen data can be posted without the um, capability for those companies to actually get that removed in a, in a timely fashion. Um, so that's largely how it's contributed. It's it's an enabler for, for criminal acts. And at the moment, I think we in the private sector and public sector and law enforcement only have, you know, kind of limited options in, in, in tackling these activities. Good points. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's largely used as a kind of a, a, a marketplace vehicle almost, isn't it? Um, so Absolutely. safe harbor for those those types of users for sure um another question for you chris what is required to join a cyber criminal forum like exploit and xss um it, it honestly depends on the site you know some are are gated and re require like a, a monetary contribution um or a, a user vouching for your access uh, or other you know means of kind of a, a prerequisite for, for joining you know, some you can you can literally, literally just sign up with a, a username and a password combination. Um, some forum forums uh, users have their accounts, you know, really verified by the forum team uh, before they can you know fully access the content. And if users you know want to purchase upgrades, so like a VIP section or a, a verified seller account, um, you know, they can usually contact one of the the forum uh, administrators directly on Telegram. To have that purchase confirmed and their upgraded account um, activated, but it, it literally just depends. But 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 often they're like I say they're they're gated and they they just require those kind of um, additional steps in order to to access the content. Okay, okay, got another question here, maybe a bit of a spin off to that one actually, and quite topical as well. So it says um, President Biden recently stated that U.S. would look to impose sanctions on cryptocurrency accounts associated with ransomware activity what impact do you think this will have on their operations that's a good question um I, I think it's difficult to say at this stage so details on the new sanctions regarding cryptocurrencies is, is quite unclear um you know they they reportedly would only target from what i've read at least uh, specific traders and exchanges as opposed to being um against a, a broader effort against the crypto industry you know and they, ha they have to kind of tread a fine line on this and while that can only be seen as you know a positive step authorities will undoubtedly need to take you know quite a bit of caution in in taking action that will impact legitimate users so earlier this year um the fbi retrieved you know quite a, a large proportion of the ransom payment that was made by Colonial Pipeline to the Dark Side Group, which does indicate, you know, a, a somewhat effective operation in, in tackling ransomware actors, uh, cryptocurrency transactions, and, and their efforts at laundering money. But I, I think at this stage, it, it's difficult to specify um, exactly how these disruptions will impact the, the criminal ecosystem, um, but it, it may force some ransomware groups to adapt their techniques or perhaps move to less trusted or secure methods of facilitating payments, which I guess in turn, you know, could assist law enforcement if they're, if they're forced to do something they're, they're not comfortable with. Perfect. Thanks for that, Chris. So I can't see any other questions just yet, but um, if anyone does have any more, use the chat box, or if you think of some later, feel free to reach out to Bytes. Um, your account manager, myself, Chris, we're more than happy to help. And the last thing I will leave you all with, and hopefully you can all see my screen there. Um, if you'd like to dive a bit deeper into this subject matter, um, or indeed um, some other areas around 
application and risk in general. We've spoken a lot about risk today. Um, if you want to explore that in more detail, evaluate the market, evaluate your position on, on this area of technology, um, we do have a dedicated workshop to the subject, um, which would be more than happy to run through with you. Uh, and of course, if you just wanted a bit more information on what that entails, we're happy to oblige as well. Um, I think there's a poll out at the moment. Do let us know if you're interested in that um, or not, and we won't bother you. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. Chris, thank you very much for, for running that session with us. It's been really insightful. Hopefully everyone else has found it um, useful as well. And I'd like to thank everyone else for their, for their time this morning. But, um, hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions if you are indeed on any of the others. Um, other than that, hope to speak to you soon. And thanks again, Chris. Thanks for your time, everyone.